you okay? Can, we, can you take me back to 1997 and talk just a little bit about how well, this all came about? I mean, for the most part of it, it's the same as I told the juries to their attorneys selecting the questions that they chose to select at the moments. Um, it still goes back to the same factors that Mr. Glossop um, co-horsed me and, and pleaded with me for over three months. Um, and the numerous amounts of money that he was offering me kept changing um, up to a point to um, to that night and that incident where, like I said, he come to my room around 3, 3.30 in the morning and just, you know, I mean, as irate as he was and kind of stuff like that, I can understand that, that <clears throat> Mr. Van Treese probably was there to jam him up on some money, which is, you know, what the victims, I guess, supposedly claim. I never knew that at, um, at the time. I didn't know that, you know, Ms. Van Treese and then people would claim that, you know, they were there to jam him up over some money that was due on the books or whatever. You didn't know Richard had been... Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know what his motivation was. Um, other than, yeah, he kept begging and pleading me until the point that he literally pushed me over an edge, right? So... He told I mean, you we're gonna we're gonna get this money, we're gonna split this money, or he said I'm gonna give you money. No, he said he was gonna pay me money. It didn't have nothing to do. The whole split in the money didn't come till the end, to where I realized, okay, you know, the the Mr. Van Trees was the one with the money, and that's where he was getting the money, and um, and then when I I got the money and brought it back to my room is when he decided he wanted to take half of it. Of course, then just keeping me held on promises that he could never uh, keep or claim. Um, now that's... How do you feel? Because there's been a lot last week with everything that's happened. Um, you see the headlines that say, you know, oh, he might be innocent. He might be, you know, like maybe he's innocent. They shouldn't... And, you know, we've talked about whether you, yeah. you, know, you didn't have any choice in them deciding to go, to go after the death penalty for him. That wasn't your choice. They just told you that if you testify, you won't get it. Um, I mean, is that what they told you? If you testify against Richard, then you pro pro pretty much won't get the death penalty? Yeah, that will, is, what it, is what that boiled down to was um, after talking with the cops and trusting the cops that they were truly going to help me when they were asking me, and then I started coming forth with the truth, thinking, okay, these are the cops, they're older, that's what their job is, is to help people, and, and doing nothing but making me false promises the same way he was making me false promises. But I let the truth be known, and then after I spoke the truth, I never decided to change the truth, um, even to my public defender after a year and a half, to begging and pleading me to take the deal. You know what I mean? I mean, she knew, the, the last resort was that if I didn't take the deal or whatever, that yeah, I was going to face death row or whatever. But I still fought with her against that, you know what I mean? Because that's not exactly what I really truly wanted to do. Because you but, didn't want to yeah. against him. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't want to have to get on stage and be center stage in front of everybody and face everybody uh, according to what I had done for him. And of course, back then, I was still looking at it like, you know, he was my friend, all this and that, but after 20 years, I realized he ain't my friend and never was my friend, or else he wouldn't have set me up in this whole scenario to begin with. You feel like his intention was always to set you up to yeah. call for this? Yeah, because then, even, even when he asked me to leave the motel after Clifford Everhart and the police put me on a task of searching the motel, he's the one that ran up to me and begged me to even leave the motel. And, uh, and, and going and telling me that he was gonna to uh, save us both, which in turn isn't what he really did because he just went down there and told him that I came and admitted it to him at five o'clock in the morning. So he told you, I'm gonna save us both, don't worry yeah. about this. Yeah, he even tried to tell me that his girl, uh, girlfriend Deanna was pregnant or whatever, which I think was just another lie too, because I mean, I've... I've did he ever tell you what he did after, because you, you guys went, you went at 4.30 in the morning about and you went and told him, okay, it's done. And then, and you were kind of messed up from the brawl of it. Yeah. And then he said, and you mentioned you broke the window. And he said, okay, we'll go get some plexiglass and we'll fix the window. So then you came back after you got the supplies and got the plexiglass and he helped you fix the window. Yeah, to, 
to a point when I say that he helped me fix the window, he was just standing there guiding me to fix the him. window. And everything that I said that, that, that I might have implemented to where we were doing it, it was him there directing me to what to do. So, but he knew that Barry Van Treese was dead. Yeah, absolutely. Time. Absolutely. And any time that he came around in that room or whatever, he, I, I look back now and notice that, yeah, he went and put some gloves on and he made sure that his little prince wasn't there. So he was just guiding a uh, misguided youth down the road anyway. So, he was just trying to track yeah, him further? Yeah, especially now that I understand his mentality wasn't of a 20-year-old, his mentality was of a 35-year-old. Because, because a lot of people thought he was younger than he was. Those were yeah, it, well, options. that's what I don't get about Deanna. Deanna's the one that told me she, she was 19 and he was 20. And I don't even understand why, when she was only like 23, 24, why she would even tell me she was 19. When, you know, I, of course I was honest with them and told them I was 19, but I didn't understand I didn't understand that lie, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Other than I could see them, she tried not to say that he was 35 or whatever, but... But you didn't know he was 35? Yeah, no, I thought they were 19 and 20. Um, why do you think, I mean, there's a lot of reasons, I know you're saying that he was trying to cover up what he'd done and, and put it all on you, but after the window got covered up, then he goes and he gets Deanna and then they go and run errands and then he goes to buy her a ring and then buy to, I mean, it was this, to you, was he just trying to cover his tracks or get away from there? At that point, were you still, you were still at the motel? Yeah, at that point I was at the motel. I knew that he left around nine-ish in the morning. Did you know what he'd gone to do? Um, he just told me that he was gonna take Deanna to a doctor and they were gonna stop by Walmart okay. and they'd run some errands for the rest, for the most part of it. You didn't know he was gonna be out like buying an engagement ring hmm. or all that? Yeah, I didn't know. I just knew something about a doctor and going to Walmart on some errands. And then what did you think when they found the car at the credit union when Billy Hooper got that call? Um, the only thing I did on that was I was in the room, and in, in my room, and she called me and told me that Clifford Everhart wanted to see me. Um, of course, I kind of thought it was weird at the time. I didn't understand, you know, why he would be there so early in the morning and stuff like that. Um, so I just went up there to see what he wanted, thought it was just going to be an average day or whatever until, you know, of course, I seen the two squad cars and him, and they were trying to do a business person's report. And I still don't even understand why him being who as old as he was and involved in law as he was supposedly supposed to be from what I understand would even send a 19 year old kid to go do the task like that so at that point they just thought he, that maybe yeah they just thought he was missing yeah they thought he was medical um did you know Cliff Everhart a little bit just from hanging around there just just from him coming in and out of the motel, um, doing security checks and stuff like that, I just I took it as he worked uh, he for Mr. Van Trees to you know hold down the security of the motel, especially on the weekends. Now, Mr. Everhart's no longer with us. He died several years okay, ago. Yeah. He testified at the trial. Did he tell the truth at trial? From what you heard, I don't know. If you heard I it, I or never or even heard any of his testimony. Um, you know, he basically his story kind of lined up with what you said. And there are people now, for whatever reason, coming out and saying that they don't. They thought Cliff Everhart might have had something to do with it, or might have, did Cliff Everhart ever have any role in this? I cannot put any fingers on this except for mine and Glossop's. I mean, like I You're said, his his total motivation of why he wanted it. The only thing that did. That, that's where I go back to saying that I can't believe Miss Van Treese and her family when she says that mm -hmm. Barry was there to jam him up on some money, and that's because it makes sense now. that because yeah because that's because of the irateness he was when he came to my room and it was like the last minute last straw type little he thing, and he was trying to pick every little vulnerability thing out of me, every, everything from continuing to offer me money to to getting me to build my rage on the fact that my older brother had left me there um, to the fact that I uh, think about what I could do with the money for my daughters and all this and that because you know I was kind of open and I talked about my life and stuff like that and I've just always been like that so but the the urgency and everything that he was in it now that kind of did you know made me go over that edge because I mean his last words leaving my room was you know if, well if we don't do it tonight then you just got to get out you know what I mean so and, and I was kind of to lost in a degree and I really thought even the roofing crew that I went back to work for the next day and stuff like that um, it was in the middle of winter I thought they already done packed up and left 
and, and the, really the only thing that starts really bothering me here lately that I know a lot more um, details on some of these, the way these people feel and stuff like that because um, seeing them on TV and them speaking a little bit of their minds and stuff like that is, is giving me the reality of where they were coming from and I've never seen these people, I've never you know known these people, I've just always been kept in the dark with all these people, is the fact that, that my mom even tells me that she called up in there in December and asked him if there was any remnants of that roof and crew around and, and she was looking for me and stuff like that and he had the audacity to tell her that I wasn't even there. So he, I feel like he's already had it planned, he already had it knowing that eventually he was gonna try to push me over an edge and, and it kinda makes me sick to my stomach because um, the reality that I actually let somebody push me over that, but then that's where I start getting into seeing the fact that I have become older and I can see vulnerability in youth and, and a lot of these kids in here that are transparent that aren't going to colleges and military schools and stuff like that and, and their brains aren't developing um, as fast as they need be. And I mean, and I just don't want people to think that I stand for, for stuff like that and I, I think it's kind of sick. And you see how some of these young kids end up in here? Right? Yeah, because I, I watch them every day to where I could, get, I could literally get these kids, some of these kids to follow me to do whatever I wanted to do, right? But I don't try to mislead them to my own devices because I think in some aspects that that's you know, what's wrong with our world. You know, Richard came really close to his execution date last week. Um, and there's a lot of people, for whatever reason, um, they really buy him whatever he's selling. His lawyers filed, filed these documents in court, and I want to read to you from these documents and let you respond to them. Is that okay? I'm just going to read mm -hmm. little bits, not the whole thing because they're long. Yeah. So one of their arguments is that the police used interrogation tactics on you that elicited false testimony. Is that true? Do they, do they okay. use Okay. I will, I will agree with the fact on using illegal activities. I mean, I don't know technically if it was really illegal because I know that they did kind of read me my Miranda rights, but they just kind of blur through those real quick and then started their attack. I think they're not saying it's illegal so much as it's just uh, manipulative. Yeah, it, I will say that it was manipulative. One, if, even if you thought that I truthfully did do something like that, well then a week later, I'm probably still not in my right mind to even grasp the concept that I just did all that. To um, to them read me my Miranda rights real quick only to start pumping me for information. Now, did they get false information from me? Absolutely not. Did they pump me and prime me to try to get the truth out of me? Then, then yeah, and, and I think that... But that, what you said was true. Yeah, what I said was true, but I also believe in the fact that, that the way some of these people want to stand, that, that, that the cops shouldn't snatch up 19 year old kids like that when they've already committed crimes or whatever and then just try to just lead them when they're promising to help them only lead them into to factual things of actually hurting them more than what they're then they're helping them yeah i mean they would say well the truth is the truth so it yeah. doesn't matter how we get it but what we were saying is however they did it they got the truth out of you yeah absolutely um this one probably going to make you angry. It says that you set Mr. Glossop up and Mr. Glossop did not do anything. What do you have to say to that? Just just like I've said from the beginning, I just landed at this motel. Um, uh, me and my brother were working for a roofing crew. Slowly but surely we got away from that roofing crew as it started getting winter time. Then my brother left me there only for Mr. Glossop to in turn be right on my bumper for the, for the last three months of, of my stay there to every time Mr. Van Tree showed up that that's what he wanted me to do. He wanted to pay me to, uh, to kill him. And it never occurred to you at the time that maybe Richard had an ulterior, ulterior motive for that? That he was stealing money or something? No, that... Did he talk about he was going to break No, I, I, never, I never really asked him, why, you want, why do you want this guy dead? I mean, what has he done to you or nothing like that? I always just kind of blew it off and shrugged it off. I didn't want to do it, you know, and, and I just, you know, tried to get him to stop talking about it sometimes and um, to the point to where it basically just got on my nerves up until the point until I gave him what he wanted. Um, so that one is categorically untrue. He's the one that set all this up is what you maintain. Yeah, absolutely. 
They said that you were a methamphetamine addict. You habitually broke into cars and motel rooms, stealing stuff, including guns, to support yeah. your, addic your addiction. Yeah, no, I, I think that's kind of funny on that part right there, mm -hmm. as far as the fact that none of that was ever brought up or anything about any of this in the whole in, entire career of this whole um, case, mm -hmm. um, except for the fact that when uh, um, they said the they nun, have an old drug dealer of yours. Yeah, well, the the, um, the nun came up here, Sister Helen, mm -hmm. and you know I said something to her about nobody really cares about the 19-year-old strung-out kid at the motel. Um, so as far as doing drugs there, yeah, but as far as breaking into motel rooms and stealing and all this, no, because a lot of the drugs I was getting there were free because there was just an allotment of it. And were you getting them from uh, Bobby Glossop or were you getting them? No, I mean, were you I was... getting them from this guy Critter that's in the affidavit? I don't... Remember a guy named Critter? Or yeah, something? well, I mean, I, I remember those two guys, but I didn't even really know them. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were, they were much older yeah. guys than me. They were there um, a couple of times. I know that they left their girlfriends there and I did associate with their girlfriends a little bit and I did get a little bit of drugs through them. Um, but as far as them guys, I don't even really know. You don't know. remember them? You yeah. didn't really, this is, they weren't a part of this? Yeah, I, I, I remember them once or twice just being at the motel for a couple of hours at a time, but as far as being there for weeks at a time, um, it was more than just their girlfriends that were there. Um, so you were just buying, you weren't really dealing, were you? No, no, I was never dealing drugs. Um, and what about this guy, this Michael Scott, that supposedly was back in around 2006. Yeah, I can't remember if he was the warden's son or the warden's nephew, but there used to be a warden here by the name of Scott and... Uh, well, there's a lot of people with I mean, I'm Yeah, I mean, I might be kind of wrong there, but that was just kind of the rumor on him when he was here. Did that, did, he was like kin to that guy or something. Um, I remember him on the run. The um, blonde guy named Yeah, he was, yeah, and... Uh, did you ever talk to him? He says that he, he was just—he was some young kid that I didn't—I didn't really associate with him too much. He might have associated with my celly at the time a little bit. I mean, that was kind of more their business and their friendship or whatever. Um, but I have absolutely no idea what he's talking about because I've never been in the penitentiary bragging about my case one way or the other. Um, people, well, I mean, would you, is it something you'd ever brag about? Because that would actually—you could actually get hurt in here for that, right? Well, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Nobody, nobody in the penitentiary just runs around bragging about their case. The only time you might talk to somebody about your case is if there's some type of legal outlet because they've went through some courses off in here, become a little bit of a paralegal, and, and you're trying to get them to elicit them to help you on filing some type of affidavit or something, then you might open up. So you didn't brag about setting up? Oh, absolutely case. not. Yeah. I mean, because you told me that that's actually, because there's someone else on death row for, and you had to testify against him, that's actually something that it's not real popular. Yeah, it's yeah, it's not real popular. Yeah, they, yeah. If I just went around here bragging about putting somebody on death row, then yeah, I would probably have threats on my own life. And it's just, it's just not something yeah. you did. You don't remember that guy. Is what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Um, and you don't remember this um, Richard Allen Barrett guy that says that you were a drug dealer? No, like I said, I, I, I kind of, I can't even visualize his face as how much is. I mean, I kind of speculate who he was affiliated with as far as the girl he that was there. He said Bobby Glossop. He said Richard's brother. Yeah, well, I can't Do even... Do you remember Bobby? I can't even remember the, their two faces. I know I know there was a guy that Richard said was his brother that came up there with another dude one time, and they, they left these two girls um, sitting there for a week, and they kind of came in and out, but I can't even put their faces. I, if you put them in a lineup, I wouldn't even remember their faces. Um... Did you have much of a criminal history when you came there? I had some hot checks out in Texas, which, uh, which, and, no. and maybe that's some parts of my honesty or whatever, is even when they were asking me about stuff that I had uh, done when I was a juvenile or something like that, and, and in reality, I wouldn't even have to release that to them. The, you know, I admitted to the fact that, yeah, um, I let some of my friends coerce me into a burglar of habitation, and I let my girlfriend coerce me into bomb threading her school in the next street over, and all that. And so, and I know that that was information that I didn't even really have to divulge to them, and they probably never would have even been able to dig it up. But they were asking me, and I was being honest. 
So, smaller crimes, bad behavior, but you've never hurt anybody before? No, before absolutely this not. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about the Cliff Everhart thing, and you mm -hmm. maintain that even though you didn't really know everything that he did around the hotel, you're 100 percent certain he had nothing to do with the, with the killing of Barry. Mary. Yeah, I don't. I don't think he did. Yeah. I don't, in, in my all honesty, I don't think he ever knew nothing about it. He was just there to help find out what happened yeah. to the guy. Um, I think that's the only thing that he might have made a little mistakes on or whatever was entrusting in the 19 year old kid that he already knew there to go search the motel for him while they got their inve investigation started mm -hmm. because I was already working there as quote unquote maintenance guy and stuff like that so but until they could get it right away. yeah no nah, he he probably would have expected me to come back and say hey I just found this guy in this room mm -hmm. um and then you took off, but only because Richard told you to. Yeah, absolutely. Is there any, was there anyone else involved? There's been allegations here and there that, oh, we don't know everything about the crime. There could have been other people involved. They, they somehow got your mother to say that you written her or talked to her and said that there could be other people involved in this. No, here's, here's what, here's what I told my mom when I first got arrested and I, and I wrote her a letter, um, because she, uh, contacted me and everything like that once she knew that I was arrested and what I was arrested for. I wrote her pretty much detail for detail what I told the cops on the truth and all that. Never implemented nobody else in the scenario, only for my mom to turn around and tell me that she need, that I needed to watch what I put in my letters to her because she knows she knew then that it would be incriminating to me and all that. But she didn't realize that I'd already opened up as much she as I'd opened up. Told the yeah, because um, she was down in Texas. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who think they're, you know, it's unfair that you were the one that physically killed Barry Van Treese and you didn't get the death penalty and that Richard did. What do you have to say in the, about that? Now, when I was really technically, when I was testifying against him and after many arguments with the attorney that I didn't have at the time, which I'm not really trying to hate on her because I think she's a really sweet lady and she does a really nice job. And, and with my case, she was put in a scenario where she had a lose-lose battle. So she was just trying to do whatever she felt she best she could do for the 19-year-old kid because I know she was 35 at the time too. and. I didn't really understand that they could carry the death penalty on him. I mean, I know, I guess, in reality, I can say that I learned that the first time, um, even when they brought me back the second time, but I still argued with that same girl the second time around because I was only like 21 then. That I still didn't want to do it. I didn't want to come back here. Um, I'd already seen this whole yard uh, turn its back against me on friends that I thought I had, all except for one. Um, and I know in some ways I made a choice um, to go ahead and come back and a lot of it had to do with a dear friend of mine. Um, and I'm not saying that I wish the death penalty on him or anything like that, other than the facts that, you know, I can see that I felt bad for it at the time, but I also feel like we all, we both made our choices to this moment. And, and he had his choices to own up to his truths because I know they offered him to sign out for this and they offered him to sign out for that. Um, I do have issues with the fact that in my daughter's confusion a little bit of the case and I sent her on a journey to go read the headlines and for whatever God's purposes or whatever she ran into some death row advocate that apparently wanted to twist a bunch of her words around just because I told her that, well, you know, maybe after 20 years or whatever, I can file for clemency and, and you know, I can, we can always just live on hope. And I didn't really even understand that she had a distorted version of the, of the case. And a lot of that has to do with, I really think that, I really think that people were telling her when she was nine years old um, the case, but they weren't really going detail for detail. Of course, she's nine years old and just went, yeah, and she just went through a traumatic experience to be in DHS custody anyway, that, um, that it, it, when I got, when I got blindsided by this letter 
three weeks later by his attorneys, which I agreed to talk to, and I talked to them on the phone, and they tried to tell me, well, your daughter wrote this letter or whatever, half of it I didn't even really believe. Um, some of it I could see that, well, okay, she might have said something about clemency, might have said something about not wanting people to die, and then they just went to twisting her words around. Um, when I told them that I wouldn't really support it and that I was gonna talk to my daughter to find out exactly what happened, um, that's why I always argue the fact of, well, if y'all felt that that was so important or that was so much of a, a key piece of evidence to be able to help him or whatever, then even though I'm not supporting it, why didn't you submit it to the clemency board? Um, instead, you withheld it from them on the people that could actually do a ruling on it. And you know, even if they wanted to stay it for a while to investigate it, only to try to outreach to the media. And I really don't blame him on the fact of trying to use every resource that comes across him to, um, to get um, his desired result. Um, but I know that he knows the truth. I know that he could see the truth then. And me going all the way back to my truths to try to really try to figure out the seed of evils in me that would make me even listen to him and make me even give that to him to look at the fact that that my daughter is at the same age that I was then and I started having I became kind of angry I became um, to a point to where I needed answers for the greater purposes of my life because I made my daughter a promise when she was two years old that I was just going to be gone for a little while and then I'd come back and give her her world that she deserved and all that. And I felt like I was um, misled and misguided. Of course, a lot of it had to do with just false promises of empires of dirt and stuff like that. But it, it really, it ate on me.